Howdy, welcome back to Dion Talk. In today's video, I am going to put a friend of mine in the spotlight. Jeff Stevens has a podcast and he interviews a lot of people on the path to financial freedom or some that have reached financial freedom. And I hear from a lot of investors how it's really hard to start investing in 2020 and 2021 because of the pandemic and the eviction moratorium and a long list of things that makes it hard to invest now. So I do my deal deep delves with people who closed on a deal recently to show that the average person can be doing deals in this current climate. So what I want to do with my friend, Jeff, is Jeff, if you'll take just a few minutes and tell me a little bit about the size of your portfolio, if you had to start from ground zero right now with no investments, with the knowledge that you have from all of the people that you've interviewed, um, myself included, I had the pleasure of being on your podcast. What would it look like now for you to start on the path to financial freedom? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the invitation to be here. I, I really appreciate that. <clears throat> um, as we record this, I have uh, like around 35 units. I always seem to forget exactly. You know, we buy a couple, sell a couple here, but around, around that, they're mostly in the Portland Oregon metro area, uh, maybe a little bit in Bend, Oregon as well. So I think numbers are all, you know, really relative. Like you could have a, a, a 40 unit portfolio in one part of the country and a duplex in San Francisco, and they'd be like the same, maybe total portfolio value. But so anyway, my, I think my real estate's worth about probably 11, 11 million or so total assets there, um, 35-ish or so units. And I, I consider myself kind of like a specialist and fo focuser on uh, off-market acquisition and seller financing. But I didn't necessarily start with exactly that level of clarity, which brings me to, you know, the answer to your, to your question. Um, if I, if I was starting over with what I know, but without, you know, any of the other resources besides, I guess, knowledge and just sort of raw skills and talent, I would tell you, I would go, I would go straight to this strategy because I know that it, it uses sort of my uh, natural gifts well. Um, I feel like I'm, I'm very good at making uh, a seller comfortable, having them feel comfortable with me. I'm very good at um, being able to engage them in a, a conversation that allows me to learn a whole lot about them and really what they're trying to accomplish, but without it feeling like an interrogation. So if I you know, was you know, dropped on a street corner somewhere with nothing really except my my perspective and my talents, the first thing I would do is I would start trying to find ways to create value in real estate without a doubt by sitting down face to face with as many people as I could. And I would start using my, um, my sort of vision, I, I'd say, to start trying to find, I like to say, I like to find deltas between what I see in a situation or a property versus what somebody else sees. You know, So when they see this, and I see this, that's kind of my, my opportunity. So even if I didn't have money, I would still have vision and I would still have my uh, understanding of some things that might be, that might be possible. Like a, a very simple example of that would be um, the idea of an accessory dwelling unit. Now, not every town in America does these, but for, for those who don't know what that is, it's basically kind of like a second apartment uh, sometimes maybe called like a granny flat or a you know, mother-in-law suite or something, but it's usually a small second apartment that can be added within the existing zoning to a single family home. And in some places you can even add them to say something that's already a duplex. So the bottom line though, is you can add another unit to a piece of property. So if I was finding myself sitting down with a seller, that might be one of the very easy, in my mind, kind of like low hanging fruit things to be looking for would be, is there an opportunity for me if I were to buy this property to add an accessory dwelling unit, which could really transform the whole picture, right? I mean, if you go from one units to two, obviously that's kind of a game changer. If you go from two units to three, that's a game changer. And so, but what, where the beauty of this comes in is if I'm talking to a seller about their single family home, if they, they of course want to sell their single family home in a way that they feel is reasonable and fair, and so I like to say that they're selling me an apple and I can negotiate that I'm buying the apple they think they're selling me, but I'm actually buying in my own mind an orange because I, I see that I'm going to transform this thing from an apple into something completely different. So I would, I would find, I would try to find myself in as many living rooms as I possibly can building relationships and just having nice kind of 
unpressured conversations, but where I could always be scanning the opportunity for, or, you know, scanning the horizon for opportunities of what I saw that things would be possible that maybe others like this particular seller don't. It's kind of ironic that, so if you started from zero now, you would look for off-market deals that are seller financed that you can add value to. Yeah. And for some of my units, I've looked at, you know, buy a two bedroom and add a third bedroom. So now that, that has more value. Yeah. And a lot of the times I reference the idea of looking for an ADU or a mother-in-law suite or however they want to call it, you know, basically two rentals on one property works just like a duplex. Especially when somebody says, I like your strategy, Dion, because my strategy is small multifamily. But they say, I can't do that because there's no small multifamily in my area. But that means somebody can build out a basement as an apartment, or you can split a split level house into two living areas or look for a house with an ADU. I mean, there's several ways to find small multifamily. And then you referenced uh, seller financing. Recently, I did a video that's actually coming out when we record this, but it'll be out before this comes out um, with Michael Zuber from One Rental at a Time and Matt, the lumberjack landlord, asking them about seller financing because I had never done it. And I actually was a little disappointed in myself that all my deals are from the MLS. <laughs> all my deals are traditional lending and I just shoot the offers off. So right after recording that video with them, I found a deal on the MLS, a fourplex for $700,000. And I thought, well, I don't have enough for the down payment for 25, 20, 20 or 25% down right now, but I have a little over $100,000. So I told my agent, send off an email saying, hey, I would like to do asking price offer with $100,000 down, seller finance the rest. And the last thing I expected was for them to come back and say, accept it. But it did. They accepted it. Wow, so nice. seller financing for off-market deals sounds great because you're getting in the living room, you're talking to the seller. I wonder how many people are missing out on the option to do seller financing for MLS deals. Mm -hmm. So I understand you're doing off-market seller financing, adding value. Do you self-manage or do you use a property manager? I self-manage. I have in the past, not recently, but I, I did for a, a period uh, use a property management company. I, for my very first property was a triplex and we self-managed that. And we hired a property manager and had a property manager from you know three units to I don't know, 15 or something like that. And then at that point, it was like, mm, I think my, I guess maybe it's obsessive quality control or just need to like, I don't know, have my hands on stuff. But I decided ultimately I wanted just a, a higher level of kind of control. So we we got rid of the property management company, brought it back in-house and then have been um, building systems. So it's funny because I would say, yes, I self-manage, but I actually don't personally manage because I, I actually have a W-2 employee who at, at my size, I just, it's like 25 hour a week person, but she's a, a long time, uh, you know, 19 year experience property manager who works for me on my, on my stuff. That is a beautiful hybrid. I like that you self-manage by creating a business where you're in control of the property manager. Uh, I so far have self-managed all of my properties. I will probably someday have a property management company, but not today. And it's always the, it's not so much the quality control for me. For me, it's the property owner and the property manager are at odds. A tenant turnover for a property owner is expensive. The rehab, any repairs you need to do, advertising, screening, placing a tenant. But a property manager, part of their business model is making money from tenant turnovers. Sometimes they have the fee of one month's rent or half a month's rent. So when I do finally decide to get a property manager, I'm definitely going to be looking for one that has a small tenant placement fee, even if it means a slightly higher monthly percentage rate, because I want them motivated to keep the tenants in place. But it probably is a little bit of the control freak in me too. If, you know, having that control, my binder strategy that gets the tenants to request a rent increase is a little easier for me to do than for me to teach a property manager how to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, your binder strategy, I think is a, gr a really, I mean, it's a, a fantastic uh, strategy in and of itself, but it's also to me very indicative of, you know, I call what I do thoughtful real estate entrepreneurship. And the, and the binder thing is, I think very much like a thoughtful strategy. You're thinking about the other person, you're helping the other person come to the conclusions you want them to, but at their own rate and pace, but, and with the information you shared with them. And I just find that basically thoughtful things require a, 
a pretty delicate touch. And I think that a, by and large, you know, a, a property management company is going to have to treat things with a little bit more of broad strokes. Like they're not going to dial into, you know, analyzing the psychology of each individual tenant with whom you want to carefully negotiate this rent increase because you just bought the property. And so to me, I really like the, the ability to just, just carefully hold some of these. There are certain relationships in real estate that are very, like very important. And just to me, very delicate. You don't want to just manhandle these things. And so to me, doing it yourself allows you to have that delicacy. Right. I find property management companies are usually what is written in the lease. That That's the rule. And as a self-manager, I mean, you want to stick to your leases. You want to have the the ability to say no when you need to. But what I really like about the binder, and, and not just for me, is the, one of the reasons why I try to share it, is it helps a landlord make more money without having to do a rehab. But it makes tenants' lives better. They don't get forced out of a property because you know the best thing for the the landlord to do would be to kick them out, do a rehab and put the rents up. So every time I share it with somebody, it's making both sides of that discussion have a better experience, which brings me to the question, the podcast racking up rentals, but you've had some amazing guests on there and you make some really cool, concise points that I like that. It's like, I just kind of want to have a separate recorder to take clips out of what motivated you to share your experience in a podcast and if you can, what is the long-term goals with it? I think there's a couple answers. Some of my calling, I guess, maybe you'd say not to be overly dramatic about it, but I think in, in some ways I was put here to, um, I've even been journaling this recently, be an example of and a guide to like shine a light on a path of real estate, of entrepreneurship from the way I perceive it in the context or the sandbox of real estate to help people become as sort of independent and self-resilient as possible. Like to me, one of like the most vulnerable persons, the one who is reliant on outside forces, like a, a job, someone to keep making their paycheck and things like that. So I personally have a deep seated belief that I, I want to help people become um, resilient. So there's, there's that. So I put that aside. I feel like this is a great channel to help kind of be an advocate for that, um, for that perspective. But the other thing is that I just remember when I got started with real estate investing, it was like taking action. I knew that was important, but you can take action and still kind of be stumbling around in the dark at the same time, right? Like it's not necessarily a perfectly clear linear path. And so I remember that the, the, the process and kind of the frustration of like stumbling around in the dark and you're bouncing into this thing, you're like, well, that didn't work and bouncing into this thing and that didn't really work. But it was when I found the right voice and a coach and a mentor that everything just sort of like, oh, all the outside voices just got quieted. The, the one, the thing, it's, I like to say, I don't know if this will you know, make sense to, to you, but if you started listening to music in the key of C and then the next thing you're listening to music in the key of you know, F minor and it, pretty soon like you're, you're consuming a lot of information, but it doesn't mean all that stuff is really compatible. And so when I found a voice that was like, the thing that really resonated with me and I was able to turn off everything else, then I, I personally really started making a ton of progress. And so I love the idea of hopefully potentially being able to be that voice of clarity that just rings true with some other people and helps them stop stumbling around in the dark and just really move forward on like one clear, more clear, seamless path. One of the things that I really like when I see you post in the Facebook groups is you're actually just trying to help people. Every post isn't look at my podcast, come take my course, you know, or, or whatever the next upsell is. You actually give good answers to questions that come up in those groups. And one of the reasons why I have this channel is because, and I don't know that we impact enough people, but I think the world is a better place when people have the jobs they want instead of the jobs they have to do. So the more people that people like you and me help reach financial freedom, the better everyone's experience is going to be. Uh, so that was actually why I reached out to see if you would come on here is because we need more people like you sharing information like this. If somebody Thank wanted you. to get a hold of you, how would they do that? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, what I, what I do is thoughtful real estate entrepreneur. So you could go to thoughtfulre.com or you know, check out the racking up rentals podcast. And I have a Facebook group called rental portfolio wealth builders as well. So anywhere in there, I try to be uh, really active and, um, <clears throat> very responsive to, to questions and things like that. And 
And yeah, and thank you for those kind words. And I feel exactly the same uh, about what you are doing as well. And that the more people, I mean, gosh, the way you just said, it, I couldn't say it any better about working because that's what you want to be doing, because not because that's what you have to be. And that's, it's very much what I was trying to say a few minutes ago about the idea of being resilient. Um, when you're making those choices voluntarily, that's a, that's a powerful thing. And I'd love to see more and more people do that. And I truly believe real estate's like, I can't think of a better vehicle for accomplishing that. I couldn't agree more. I, I, and it shocks me that more people don't even consider it. And th there is some barriers to entry. And I'm confused when I run into a lot of real estate agents who work with investors, but the agents don't have any investment properties. Yeah. Um, so someone who's exposed to it, you think, would be more likely to invest as well, which is why I think your content is great and more people should tune in because it's, it's that fear when we first start out, if we can get past the fear. Most things in real estate are terrifying the first time you do it. The second time, it feels like we could teach a class. So people just got to get to that second time. Thanks okay. a lot for coming on today. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it as well. Until my next video, thanks for coming to my Dion talk. We're sorry, the number you have dialed is not in service at this time. Awesome. Yeah. Like I said, after Desert Storm, I have some memory issues. And that is my go-to. When somebody says, why do you invest? And why do you share the information? And I, I, I want to be able to say every time, because the world's a better place when people do jobs that they want to instead of jobs they have to. And I always remember it like way after I'm, I should have said it. And that would have been my answer on, on your podcast when you asked the question, if I remembered it. <laughs> It is a nice, concise you know, way to put it. And I just totally, totally agree. Cool. Okay. I think we're good. And um, if a subject comes up in the future where you think I house hack, I self-manage, I buy off the MLS, um, anything subject that you would like covered, reach out and I'll try to help if I can. That's awesome. Yeah. I, you know, actually the idea of, of house hacking is something we've never even really mentioned on my show. So that, Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, I'd love to cover that because that, that was the game changer for me. Yeah. And, and not yeah. so much the first house act. The first house act was nice. The second house act, just being willing to move from one side of town to the other side, because I got to rent out the unit I moved out of into a property that cash flows. The new one cash flows 1700 a month, even with me living there. The old wow. one now cash flows 800 a month with me renting out both units. So that was a $2,500 a month increase to my income just by moving. And, and, so someone paying for a house, let's say their mortgage is fifteen hundred, and I'm getting twenty five hundred for this move. There's a four thousand dollar gap in our income before we look at any rental properties outside of those two and any W two job. So I think more people should think of it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, I'll I'll roll that around in my mind. Cool. All right, man. Um, have a good week. <laughs>